Welcome to worship at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. If you want to know more about our church here in Cincinnati, we encourage you to click the link to our website. But for now, settle in, take a deep breath, and prepare your heart for worship as we begin with contemplative music. that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome Mount Washington Presbyterian Church to worship this morning. Let us come before our Lord and worship with gratitude and joy, for indeed, this is the day that the Lord has made. we gather together for worship, let us join in prayer. Loving God, we come before you to confess that we often look for comfort outside of you. We come before you to confess our need of your presence and your guidance. Our sinfulness and hard-heartedness often push us away from healthy relationships and lapse us into conflict. We would rather talk about people instead of talking to people. We would rather avoid the hard work of making peace instead of seeking healing and wholeness. Forgive us for our divisive and sinful behaviors. Heal our brokenness 
and move us to seek reconciliation. Isn't it good news that we are forgiven for all that is past? For we know that the Lord is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love for us all. Amen. because it's time for the time with children. Today, we're going to hear a story about a little boy who did something small, but God made it into something great. We're going to hear about the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, a miracle in fact. And reading that story reminded me of a story my grandmother used to read to me. It's called Stone Soup. I'd like you to watch it. Stone Soup retold by Heather Forrest, illustrated by Susan Gaber. There was once a comfortable little village nestled in the mountains. The people who lived there had more than enough to keep themselves content. One day, two travelers came along. Their coats were tattered. Their hats were torn. Their dusty shoes had holes in their soles. Hungry and tired, one traveler said to the other, Surely someone here can spare us a bit of food. They knocked boldly on a door. It cracked open, and a woman asked, What do you want? Please, said one of the travelers, We are hungry. Do you care? Will you share? Do you have any food? The woman squinted her eyes and tartly replied, No. She quickly slammed the door shut. 
The travelers walked a little further down the road and knocked on another door. A young boy answered. His chocolate brown eyes were sweet. Good day, he said shyly. What do you want? Please, said one of the travelers. We are hungry. Do you care? Will you share? Do you have any food? The boy replied, there is no food here and closed the door. The travelers wandered wearily through the village, knocking on every door. But everywhere they heard, I don't care, I won't share, there is no food. They sat to rest beside a well. One traveler sighed and clutched his empty belly. He said, if there really is no food in this elegant little village, then the people who live here are in greater need than we are. We should make them our magical soup. The two travelers climbed up the edge of the well and shouted, We are master cooks. If anyone in this town has a big black pot, we will make the most delicious soup anyone ever tasted. A door slowly opened. A round man emerged carrying a gigantic black pot. I love to eat, he said. Here's a pot. Let me see what two master cooks can do with it. Watch and see, said one traveler with glee. The travelers filled the pot with cold water and built a fire. Soon, the flames licked the sides of the pot and billows of steam rose into the air. Curious people began to gather. What is happening? the townspeople asked. We are making an unusual soup, said one of the travelers. It requires a special magical ingredient. I am certain we will find it in this town. All the eyes in the crowd watched as one of the travelers reached down and picked up an ordinary stone. He tossed it into the pot with a splash. We're making stone soup, he said. It will be nutritious, delicious, incredible, and edible. But it would taste better, he paused and said. <sighs> if only we had a carrot. Where would we find a carrot in this town, the other traveler asked. We knocked on every door and everywhere we heard, I don't care, I won't share, there is no food. Then perhaps we cannot make the delicious soup after all, they both announced with a sad shrug of their shoulders and began to turn away. A child timidly raised her hand and said, Wait, I might have a small carrot. Excellent, shouted the travelers. Bring what you've got, put it in the pot, we're making stone soup. This magical soup would taste even better if we had a potato, they added. A deep voice in the back of the crowd called out, I have a potato. Wonderful, shouted the travelers. Bring what you've got. Put it in the pot. We're making stone soup. It would taste better still, they said, if we had just a few more ingredients. Perhaps, said one villager, I could bring a green bean. Well, said another, if you're going to bring a green bean, I will bring a kernel of corn. I shall not be outdone, cried another. I will bring an egg noodle. One by one, voices announced, I will bring a slice of celery. I will bring a pinch of pepper. I can bring a sprig of parsley. I might have a tiny turnip. Well, why are you waiting, cried the travelers. Bring what you've got. Put it in the pot. We're making stone soup. Everyone in the town ran home to bring one small thing to put in the pot. Food flew through the air and landed with splashes in the growing soup. Soon, the huge pot was full and simmering. A wonderful smell drifted through the air. The smell was so tempting, people brought out bowls, spoons, chairs, and tables. They placed hearty loaves of bread, chunks of cheese, and bowls of fruit on the tablecloths. Everyone came to taste the soup and marveled at the flavor. It's amazing, said one woman. These two travelers made such a delicious soup out of a stone. Out of a stone, the travelers, with a grin. And a magical ingredient, sharing. As the travelers left the town, they said, If anyone ever wants to make the soup again, just remember the recipe. Bring what you've got, put it in the pot. Every bit counts, from the largest to the least. Together, we can celebrate a stone soup feast. I love that story. I love that last line. Let me read it to you one more time. Bring what you've got, put it in the pot. Every bit counts from the largest to the least. Together, we can celebrate 
a stone soup feast. Remember kids, no matter how small you are or how small what you can offer to God, God will do something amazing with it. God will do miracles with what you can offer. Amen. At Mount Washington, we're entering into a new sermon series titled Unlikely Heroes. And this morning, our hero is a child. We're about to hear the scripture, the story of that child. But before I do, before we tell that story, let's all remember that the word of God can come to us, can bless us in so many ways. We can receive the word of God through scripture, through music and song, through nature, and even through videos. And so today, our scripture is a video story of the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So let's prepare our hearts to hear that. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Prepare your heart to hear a miracle. This is the story of how God used something small to do something great. Our story begins with Jesus. He was in the countryside and people came from far and wide to listen as he taught the word of God. The crowd grew till it was great, the day started getting late, but there was one thing that they all forgot. Food! Nobody brought food, and everyone was hungry, but there were too many people to just go out and buy some. So they asked Jesus what to do. Jesus said, what do you have? The twelve disciples started asking people in the crowd if they had food. They found some, but it wasn't much. A little boy had brought his lunch, and he gave it for the Lord to use. Yeah, he gave his lunch for the Lord to use. He had two fish and five loaves of bread. There was no way that would feed all those men But Jesus had a plan He took the fish and loaves of bread Held them up over his head And blessed the food, giving thanks to God The food began to multiply And soon every girl and guy ate all they could It tasted so good and there were tons of leftovers for everyone Especially him The little boy gave what he had It wasn't much to him, but to Jesus It was infinitely, absolutely, positively huge And that's the story of how Jesus used two fish and five loaves of bread To feed thousands of people I love that God takes something small and makes it into something great. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hey, Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. This August, we're starting a new series called Unlikely Heroes, a series about people in the Bible that we might not have expected to be heroes. And today we're gonna to start with this amazing story of the feeding of the 5,000. Let me read the scripture text for today from John 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, he said to his disciple Philip, Where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? Jesus said this to testify, uh, to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to eat a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. 
Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were all satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. And when the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. The word of God. Thanks be to God. You know, as we're beginning this series on unlikely heroes, I wanted to start with the feeding of the 5,000. Originally, this would have been a communion Sunday and an opportunity for us to actually break bread together. But today, we're going to have to think about communion in different ways. And as you may know, a few weeks ago, we were able to serve communion at one of our social distancing picnics. But given the current context, we have no ability to do that right now, but we're working on it. We'll figure out ways to be able to share the sacrament together in the future. But I think it's important that we look at this context of the story. You know, like most of us, we think about this story and we think, oh, let's talk about the miracle itself. How did like a little teeny piece of bread become enough to feed 5,000 people? You know, some people suggest that maybe the way that it happened was some sort of miraculous multiplying and one little piece became two, became three, became 10, became 20. And that's the nature of the miracle. While others have suggested that the nature of the miracle itself was as they passed around the baskets, people began to take out of their own lunch boxes, so to speak, and began to share with one another. And that's how the miracle happened. But today I don't want to focus on the miracle itself. That's a discussion for another sermon. And boy, we could unpack that with a lot of fun. What I want to talk about is an unlikely hero in this story. A little boy. A little boy who does something rather extraordinary. But let's back up a little bit and before we think about that little boy and think about the context of what's happening when we reach this story in John 6. You know, we know that Jesus has been two years into his ministry at this point. He's already been back and forth to Jerusalem at least once and seems like he's on his way to go a second time. And in these just few chapters of John, John's told us that Jesus has turned water into wine. He's healed the uh, paralytic or the paralyzed man at the pools of Bethesda. He's also had a midnight sort of conversation with Nicodemus about what it means to be born again. He's challenged the religious elite in so many different ways. And he's also disrupted by overturning the tables in the temple. And remember, right before this happened, he evangelized the Samaritans, the so-called enemies of the Jews. You see, Jesus has been healing the sick. He's been teaching and preaching, and he's been disrupting everything. No wonder there's a crowd of people following him, mobbing him, so to speak. They want to hear more about what Jesus has to say. And in particular, they want to see these miracles that people have been talking about happen to them. They want to see it for themselves. But it says that Jesus, while he was in the Sea of Galilee, having come from the south in Judea, comes up and it it appears that he wants to take a break. Understandably, he goes with his disciples to the top of a mountain. A mountain in the Bible is often a symbol of a sacred place, a a place where God can talk to one. And Jesus goes there for a moment of, of refreshment and reflection with his disciples. And then what does he see? A large crowd beginning to amass at the bottom of this mountain. Uh, You can imagine the people standing around. I mean, we're talking about 5,000 people. And Jesus begins to look at them and maybe maybe the sun was beginning to uh, set or something, but he notices that the people apparently appear to be hungry. Maybe he got a messenger from someone in the crowd that there wasn't enough food to eat. You'll have to remember that in those days, there were no fast food restaurants. You couldn't pull off to the side of the road and just grab a bite. There also weren't huge stores, although there were villages that served as markets, but those villages were on the Sea of Galilee and those villages were small. Could they possibly have accommodated 5,000 people in this really desolate region? 
Well, the answer was no. And so Jesus turns to his disciples and says, what are we going to do? We, I see a need here. I see that they're hungry. Remember, not unlike that story in Mount Sinai when Moses comes down and he's now ushering the people through the wilderness and they're complaining and grumbling because they're so hungry and they don't know how they're going to feed them. Wasn't it better back in Egypt back in the day when we used to have our full stomachs even though we were slaves? And yet in that moment, God provides a miraculous provision for them in the wilderness. And it says in the text that the Passover of the Jews was near. This remembrance that the Jews went through every single year was on the minds of the people. And so even though they were hungry, maybe they looked with expectation to Jesus. Would Jesus be like the great God Jehovah and provide for them in some miraculous means? We don't really know all the aspects of the story because the story is quite terse in its telling. But we do know that there was a crowd of people that needed to be fed. In fact, 5,000 people, I mean, what's that the equivalent of? Like, think of a music hall. Music hall is, can seat 2,500 people in the seats. So now double that. Think about that. How could they possibly have found provisions for 5,000 people? But another thing we need to understand about the Middle Eastern culture and particularly ancient Israelite culture is that hospitality was an expectation. You know, there was no excuse, no excuse, whether you were rich or poor, you were not allowed to get out from underneath the demand that if a stranger or even an enemy showed up at your door, you were expected to provide hospitality. Poverty could not be an excuse for not providing out of the means that you had and just show hospitality. In other words, providing a place to sleep or food to eat to some traveler who was on the road. It didn't matter whether you knew them, whether they were your family, and like I said, it didn't even matter if you were, the, you were sworn enemies. There was a law that said you were to provide food and hospitality. And so it's not surprising that when Jesus says, how are we going to find a way to feed all these people? He was just reflecting the cultural mandate that was expected. All these people were here, and as the host of that gathering, as the reason why they were there, they needed to be able to meet that need somehow. And so it's not surprising that the reaction from the disciples was, what? What are you talking about? How can this possibly happen? In fact, we have one of the disciples saying, it would take us six months wages to fill all these people. In other words, we need a benefactor. We need someone who's rich. We can't possibly do this. And yet another disciple says, here's a young lad, a young lad who has just five loaves of barley bread and two fish. Jesus, he's willing to offer that up to you. You know, it's interesting to me when I think about the story, I think about my time in the Middle East, which of course I've talked about a lot, but I'm thinking about an experience that happened several years ago to me and a friendship that was born out of that experience. My uh, friend, who's also a pastor, Mary Ellen Nathada and I were in the Middle East. In fact, at this particular occasion while we were there was uh, to scatter my mom's ashes. 10 years after she died, we decided to go to the Sea of Galilee and scatter her ashes over some of the cliffs that oversaw the, the um, Sea of Galilee there. And so Mary Ellen and I were in the Middle East and we were wandering around doing what we always do. And we had decided to go out into the Judean wilderness, out into this barren, barren land to, over, uh, to an overlook, which is where a monastery hangs on the edge of these cliffs that oversee this just rugged, rugged desert. And we had friends who we knew, knew one of the caretakers there. And because they wouldn't let women into the monastery, we decided we needed to check in with that caretaker because we just wanted to make sure that our car would be safe if we, you know, hiked down the path or into those rugged valleys and wanted to have a chance to make sure that we were safe, but also that our car would be safe. And so a friend of ours got in touch with a man named Mohammed and told us that Mohammed would meet us, which he did right when we drove up. And so we, through sign language, because my Arabic at the time was pretty lousy, in fact, it really still is, but I have very little Arabic right at that point, and he had no English. He signaled to us, though, to follow him, and so we did. 
We're a little unsettled at this point because our drive out to this desolate place had been filled with various challenges. We had been assaulted by a donkey on the middle of a trail, believe it or not. We'd had some Bedouin children sort of come and stop us and, and beg. And so we were really kind of unsettled and feeling a little unsure of how safe things were. But Mohammed signaled to us and, and so we followed. What was so surprising about this was after a series of picture taking that he allowed us, showed us the perfect spot to take us with the monastery in the background. He led us down to a little path and in there was a fire burning. The fuel for that fire was just the dung from goats that they had collected. And against the wall of that little cave, like in the pebbly rocks was bread slapped across the wall. And around the corner, a woman, her name was Aisha, came and greeted us. And she was cooking that bread in this outdoor sort of camping, like sort of primitive way. Well, we followed Aisha after she removed the bread and still just using sign language, not having any language between us. She led us up to her tent, which was really just a very small, small sleeping space with a small cooking space. The poles were just metal poles with plastic tarp being shaped all around this tent. And she invited us in and there she offered us her meager provisions of bread and olives. That conversation, such as it was, a lot of uh, sign language and a lot of using our phone. She had no phone or no electricity in her tent. Showing her pictures of her children, we found out things about her children and her family and her experience. And what we experienced was the hospitality of the, the Bedouin people there. It was, it was an amazing experience, unexpected experience. But as I've come to know that when a stranger crosses the path of someone in the Middle East, food is always extended. The home is always opened up, no matter how poor, impoverished, meager it may be. And over the years, I've run into Aisha quite a few times. I've been invited into her home. My kids who have been with me traveling in the Middle East have been invited in for suppers, even though we still have no, no real language to share it with each other. In fact, even this last November when I was there, I went out and I was with a friend of mine, Amy, who was living in Jerusalem at the time. And we went out to that same cliff to pray. And she came around the corner with her husband and she had just a bag with two or three loaves of this flattened pita bread that she would have baked against the uh, side of a cave. And when she saw me, her face lit up. She recognized me and, and went, oh, hi, hi, hello, 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 or mahaba, mahaba, which is how you say hello in Arabic. And she said, she signaled to me that she was in a hurry and couldn't stay to talk and couldn't invite me back to her tent. But out of her bag, she pulled this, ba this beautiful loaf of bread and offered it to me and insisted that Amy and I take it. And then she scurried off. The, the encounter was all of maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half. But it shows the nature of the expectation of hospitality in the Middle East. A stranger becomes a friend. Even an enemy can become an ally when one shares a meal together. So significant is hospitality that even for this young boy in this story, it was expected that whatever you have should be offered up into the service of others who may need it more than you. You know, that's the amazing thing about this unlikely hero in this story, is that this little boy, somehow, whatever his meager provisions were, felt it was worth offering up. Now, one thing in the story that you may not know is that it notes that it was barley loaves. Barley loaves is the bread of the poorest of the poor in ancient Israel. It's a flour that's milled and only it's the gleanings and often the leftovers and only the poorest would have this. So this was a, a very meager offering. This wasn't the fine flours or fine breads that would be offered to an exalted guest. This was just the provisions of a very extremely poor young boy. But the astonishing thing about this is this little boy put that offering in the hands of Jesus. And when we give our gifts to Jesus, whether they're meager in their financial size, or whether it's our talents and gifts, or, or whether it's our time, no matter how little or much of it that we have, 
when we give up ourselves and entrust it into Jesus' hands, Jesus can take it and can facilitate a multiplication that we've never seen the likes of before. That's what happened in this story with this unlikely hero. And that's what can happen for us here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. You know, I know many of you give to our, our general budget, and part of our general budget, of course, goes to mission. In addition, we have a hunger fund that many people contribute to th throughout the year. But with those small and meager gifts, there, there aren't huge size gifts that come into any, any of our churches in a rich church in that sense. We don't have some rich benefactor that can bribe six months wages. It's, it's all the gifts and the small gifts, but the significant gifts of people like you and me. We, we're unlikely heroes, aren't we? But we give those gifts and then in the hands of Jesus, they multiply. You know, in this crazy time of, you know, escalating unemployment and the rise of the COVID crisis, we are just facing so many challenges. In fact, we're still not able to worship back in our building. But it hasn't stopped us from feeding the hungry, which is one of our primary missions, a calling that we feel is so deep within our Mount Washington Presbyterian Church DNA. And so even though we can't distribute food in the ways we used to or do things the way we used to, it hasn't stopped mission from happening. So even in these uh, escalating unemployment and rise in the cases of COVID and the risks that are there, we're still able to provide food at local elementary schools twice a week. We also, instead of having a, a mobile food pantry that we used to have once a quarter here on our campus, we now have a drive-through mobile food pantry that we're able to do almost every month since the crisis has started. We are finding multiple, multiple ways to share the gifts of our leadership. The SEM board, for example, that the new food pantry that's gonna be just up the street at Mount Washington, with the support of our church and other churches, they were able to secure the building and now are improving that building. And soon there will be a, a huge food pantry right here in Mount Washington, right locally. It's exciting what's happening and our church provides leadership for that board. So you see your financial gifts, the volunteer time that you offer, the leadership that we provide, all of those offerings, whether small, or extraordinarily large? Were there people with great experience and talents that just are supercharged? Or whether it's the simple offerings of those of us who just have time and, and wanna make a difference. All of us placing our gifts into the hands of Jesus means that Jesus takes our gifts and we can multiply them. And we have seen that multiplying effect as people in our city and in our local area have been able to be fed. It's the goal of our church that not one person should go hungry, not one child should go hungry. And therefore, we're constantly thinking of new ways, creative ways to take the simple offerings of unlikely heroes like you and transforming them into the multiplying miracles that Jesus wants us to offer. Friends, as we continue in this series about unlikely heroes, remember that it doesn't take someone that's big and flashy or famous or even rich to make a difference. Our unlikely hero reminds us today that even the gifts of a small child, a poor child can make a difference. The gifts that you offer, the talents that you share, the time that you give make a difference in God's kingdom. May our church be a leader in trusting Jesus with who we are and whatever gifts we have to bring. May we be a leader in showing that we can trust Jesus to multiply our gifts for the greater good of God's kingdom. And God's people said, Amen.
Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. God of all creation, God of the towering and the tiny, the haughty and the humble, the mighty and the meek, the confident and the confused, hear our prayer. Strengthen us for a life of generosity, service, and faith. Teach us that no giver is too small and no gift is worthless. Remind us that every voice counts, even, or perhaps especially, those systematically silenced by our society. Remind us that no effort to help is too insignificant and no act of love for others goes unnoticed. We pray today for our world. Keep anger and greed away from the powerful. Reveal to them better solutions than war and fear and make them good stewards of your creation. We pray today for our country. Instill in our leaders compassionate hearts, restore integrity and honesty, and teach them to care for all and not just some. We pray today for our immediate community. Where there is hunger, send us. Where there is loneliness, send us. Where there is pain, send us all so we can be examples of your boundless love. And we pray today for our congregation. We have those with health issues or who are in mourning. Provide them comfort and aid their healing. We have those who are anxious and afraid because of uncertainties. Provide them with a foundation of support. We have those who are facing personal struggles. Remind them that nothing Nothing can separate them from your love. Make us all instruments of your will, that we may be a source of comfort, support, and love for our neighbors in need. We ask this all in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, now go out from this place, knowing that even the unlikeliest of heroes can make a difference in God's kingdom. Offering all that you have as a person, offering generously the gifts that you have and talents to serve, we can make a difference in God's mission in the world. 
So go out, be God's unlikely heroes in the places where God has called you. And God's people said, Amen. Hi, my name is Debbie Whaley and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you joined us this week for worship and we hope that you'll join us again. If you'd like to know more about our ministries, please follow us on the web at mwpc-church.org. Have a great week.